All right, welcome everyone. Uh, so I had the first agenda um, and I just wanted to, this was kind of an idea that uh, I was thinking about a little bit after our group conversation and some of the traffic that we're getting for people uh, interested in fuzzing for their customers and um, um, is whether we should produce like a fuzzing for dummies uh, brown bag for lack of a better term, we should come up with a better name for that. But uh, basically a, a really intro level in, uh, discussion of what fuzzing is, why customers might be interested in it, uh, that might give our salespeople and some of our technical account managers uh, some information on how to, to learn more and, and how to pitch this to some of our customers. So I just wanted to throw that out there as an idea. Um, obviously, we got a lot going on, so we'd have to figure out where this fits in, but I uh, wanted to get uh, everyone's thoughts on, on whether that would be useful or if they think, if they think there's a need for it. Yeah, I mean, I think education is good. Um, I think I was just discussing with someone this uh, this week about how, you know, the the term for fuzzing has been overloaded a lot, uh, and so it'd probably be really great to produce some content um, to educate that maybe we can then further turn into stuff that's customer facing as we move forward. Uh, since I think we're going to have to explain, you know, the intent of our tools and. Um, you know, the types of fuzzing that we're going to do and how we're communicating that and, and so on. Yeah, I agree. I, I like it. Cool. So what I'll do is I'll open up a uh, brown bag issue for this. Um, and then on that issue, we can just discuss um, what we want to cover in this, this fuzzing for dummies, because it sounds like there could be a whole series of, of content that we produce. Uh, and we'll just need to figure out what our audience for each one is so that we can try to make these, um, you know, short and pithy and, and educational uh, and not try to cover everything in, in one session. Cool. Uh, Camilla, uh, I think the next one is you. Yours, uh, you want to talk a little bit about uh, design? Uh, yeah, I haven't really worked on interface yet, but I did create a doc with Sam and ran it over with some other designers that there are some technical assumptions and some ideas at the end. It's just really an idea um, written level. So for example, like we can change the maybe severity of the fatting result from unknown to other things or cooperate with uh, like math to see there's something we can work with, with the highlight unknown result or something like that. So if you have anything, just go to the doc, uh, add ideas at the bottom. And if you think like everything on the top are some assumptions we have, you have different ideas and just comment on it, then I know that you want to change something. So ideas you can directly put there and uh, for the assumptions, please comment on it. Perfect. And uh, I just clicked on the doc. I don't have access. I don't know if anyone else is. Uh, having... yeah, same here. Um, I sent a request for access. Oh, I will update the link. Sorry for that. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Sounds good. So uh, if I understand There's correctly, no you're you're working on the idea generation right now. And then once we have some comments in there, then you're going to start working on the design. Is that the process? Uh, yeah. Or like, I, I think next week I will start like uh, work on this. So this week I will keep putting ideas. Okay. That's great. Yeah. I think some of that will be, uh, and I think James is going to talk about this. The terminology will be really important to try to lock that in particularly for the design. So we make sure that the design represents the correct terms. Sounds good. Uh, so the next item that I uh, just wanted to share is I just set up the uh, basically three repositories for uh, the coverage guided fuzzing tool um, and wanted to make sure everyone knows the structure that we're doing for this. So we have the first is a repository. It's our it's our project, but it's also a repository, which is uh, GitLab COV fuzz dash source. And that is private, so only GitLab team members can see that and uh, update source code or contribute source code into that repository. Because it's a private project, people outside of GitLab are not able to access the container registry or anything inside that project. So that created a problem for us when we want to publish uh, images to our Docker um, container registry or publish uh, binaries. So the solution to that is we created uh, GitLab COV fuzz. Uh, which is right below it, which will be available for our Docker images and for the binaries. So we'll use that uh, as our publishing. There won't necessarily at this point be any repository in there other than perhaps a readme and where we're storing binaries. Uh, so there's no source code in that second uh, link. 
And then the third is within security products uh, slash demos. Uh, that's where we can put sample projects. Um, and that's, you know, projects that customers can download, play around with, tweak, uh, and try to use that as a sample for how they want to set up their own work. So that's the structure that we set up for uh, this tool. I want to make sure everyone's aware of that because I would imagine we'll do uh, something very similar for the API fuzzing in terms of the structure. Um, if there's any questions or concerns on this, uh, certainly let me know. Um, and then you know we'll we'll work through make sure our naming is consistent as well. Um, but right now this is uh, I think the name that we've agreed on, which is the GitLab COV fuzz uh, for that for that tool. James, I think you get the next one. Yep. Uh, let's see. So after, let's see, I created this issue at the end of the day yesterday and I reread it this morning. I think I may have come across a little strong, <laughs> um, but long story short, uh, the issue is about mm, us using the term coverage to describe a category of fuzzing when that is just one aspect of fuzzing. It's like a one feature of fuzzing, right? Um, so API fuzzing can use coverage, uh, the using libfuzzer or AFL or gofuzz, they can use coverage. Um, coverage is just one technique, one piece that could be used, right? And so <clears throat> I was realizing that uh, I, the real reason for me creating the ticket is that I personally was getting, starting to get confused about what category things were falling into. Um, and if I was going to get confused about it, um, the users might, if they knew about some of the technology being used, or if they knew API fuzzing was using code coverage to improve its fuzzing performance, then they might think it is the coverage-based fuzzing instead of just API fuzzing, right? Um, so yeah, it's a, a, that's the gist of it. Um, I don't... Mm, I haven't had time to update the ticket some more. So there are the different pieces of the mm, fuzzing technology that we could use to categorize it. And so like it does, it's a mutation based fuzzing or a gene uses genetic fuzzing algorithms or, um, or you could talk about what it's fuzzing. Um, the other aspect is, so API fuzzing, um, you, that one's kind of talking about two different things. It's talking about what you're fuzzing, but also the specific fuzzer that you're using. Um, we are using an API fuzzer, right? Um, <laughs> and so it's a, uh, for the, what we're calling the coverage-based ones, um, we are using libfuzzer, uh, gofuzz, or wrapping AFL. Um, there's, uh, yeah. Um, anyway, so these are all the things swimming through my mind when I made the ticket, and um, I, I'll admit I should have probably waited another day to try and solidify my thoughts and have a better proposal. Um, but the term coverage is applies to all of the different types of fuzzing and it was becoming confusing to me. Um, so I, I will update the ticket, uh, talking about a few more things, but that was the gist of it. Yeah. Thanks for creating that. I think that was, a. Uh... That's a great thing to point out. Um, and I kind of agree. I think in the future, you know, um, we're likely to use a lot of these techniques across all the different fuzzers we have. Uh, and so kind of figuring out a, a reasonable naming system that's going to, you know, not end up confusing people in the future is, I think, a good idea. Um, I think, you know, when I read it, my first thought also is like, I think one of the reasons that it's convenient to call things like coverage and, and, and behavioral is, that's a lot of times how customers talk to us about stuff. You know, um, a lot of the conversations I tend to have is like, they'll, will be the things like, I hear AFL is good. Do you fuzz like AFL does type of thing? Right. Um, but I liked your suggestion that, you know, we don't have to necessarily name the project like that. We could simply have, you know, categories that these different fuzzers kind of fit into and have that knowledge publicly available and probably train, you know, the sales team to understand how to talk about, the fuzzing capabilities and stuff that we have. Yeah, and it's, mm, th there is kind of a third way to look at it. It doesn't play very well into marketing. In, in general, it's all fuzzing. And then you configure the fuzzer to fuzz the specific target, right? <laughs> um, yeah. But for marketing, I would not recommend we go that route. Um, it, that 
mm, would assume a lot of knowledge in the user about what all of that means. And so, okay, choose your type of fuzzer and say, I'm gonna choose an API fuzzer and then you configure it in the YAML um, or whatever UX we provide the user for that. I think that would be too much. Um, in the past, when I've made tools, that is the approach I've taken where it's just all fuzzing and then you choose the fuzzer, the debugger, the mutation aspects and you configure all of it. Um, but that's not what we're going for. So there is a distinction there between the marketing and the user facing terms. Um, or at least some type of distinction uh, and specifically how we talk about it. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree, agree with that. Um, my biggest question I, I had when reading the issue uh, was where are we talking about specifically and which names? Because yeah, to your point, things that are gonna be super high level marketing, architecture documents versus low level technical documentation and everywhere in between, I think we can take different levels of granularity depending on the depth, but I, I wasn't quite clear about what this issue was talking about specifically. Gotcha. Um, I 100% see what you're saying on that. I will <laughs> rephrase the description um, and make it concrete about what I'm talking about. Um, I, I could say it right now, the, the concrete aspect that really got me thinking about it is, uh, so I've been working with Evgeny on the schema and everything, but I've talked to Mike about also using coverage-based mm, features in API fuzzing and potentially in the future for doing unit test drive stuff, it also uses coverage-based stuff. So that's where it all started. Um, and I, I'll boil it down to the concrete things that we are currently using or currently have and talk specifically about those. Um, uh... Yeah, so for sure, I think the, the, the naming should be consistent. Uh, I think the only uh, example that uh, I found uh, like uh, in terms of uh, continuous fuzzing uh, of like uh, cover leap fuzzer or AFL uh, is uh, cluster fuzz. And when you go like in there, maybe I'll send the link. Um, uh, here, so when you go to their like homepage, uh, they call it support for coverage guided fuzzing, and, and I use I use the same term. So I can't, I mean, I can't say this is an industry standard because there is only one example of it and uh, uh, fuzz it, right? Uh, but uh, like the, the, this is uh, like I, I saw people people use it for for li like leap fuzzer. Uh, AFL GoFuzz is like coverage guided fuzzing and other one are like API fuzzing or behavior fuzzing that um, uh, I think it makes sense. But uh, yes, of, of course, like, uh, yeah, it can be coverage can be also applied to, to other stuff as well. Yeah, well, and I guess there's a third option where we just say we are okay with some overlap in definitions and we just phrase things correctly to the user and say, this is talking about this category, even though they might use the same underlying feature. Um, something like that might work too, so. Well, I think also what we can do here, since we're just getting started, we can see if the naming does introduce confusion or if users understand it. Um, picking a name, you know, if there's a famous Shakespeare quote about it, so, if we find it's introducing confusion, maybe we should investigate changing it. But we also, I think whatever we pick, there's gonna be uncertainty whether we change it or continue to use the same sorts of terms. Yeah, and, and, and anyway, I think we'll have to do a lot of education, just like Mike said, you know, people are not aware, like just asking, yeah, is, is this AFL? I heard about AFL, uh, like we'll have to make education about like, what, what fuzzing is, what tools are, are available, when to use which tool. Uh, anyway, so we'll have to make uh, also education about uh, what terms we use and I tell them that this is, uh, those are the correct terms. I, I think where the technical accuracy is really important is things like our CLI, if we're calling it COV fuzz, and we start using other fuzzing technologies in there. Uh, I think that's where we really need to make sure that the adjectives we're using are, are correct. Uh, I think at a marketing 
sometimes we can have higher level buckets that, you know, there's a little bit crossover and they don't quite clearly line up with the technical, but definitely when we start getting into the implementation, uh, I think we've got to make sure that it's, it's accurate there. I think that's it for me. Um, unless somebody else has more on the terminology. Uh, one question I had is uh, terms like continuous fuzzing. Um, Sam, I don't know if there's any particular terms that we're looking to kind of own, if you will, as GitLab. Uh, continuous fuzzing is doesn't look like there's a single owner of that right now. I don't know if that's something that GitLab is going after or whether there's other permutations of that type of uh, yeah. marketing term speak, so to speak, um, that we're trying to to really make sure GitLab becomes well known for. Yeah, so we haven't necessarily identified some of those key terms that we want to own specifically yet. Um, behavioral fuzzing and coverage guided fuzzing are what we're leading with in terms of our categories and our marketing. So those are the two we're starting with. Uh, it is a good point though about if there are terms like continuous fuzzing or similar that we should investigate. Um, happy to discuss that with marketing if there, or if there's any other terms you all think we should be think we should be tracking and owning, you know, let's talk about those two. Oh, yeah, I think in terms of uh, marketing, it might, it might be, well, it might be useful to, to consider continuous fuzzing uh, as, as a term, at least from like S, uh, SEO perspective. So like when you write continuous fuzzing on Google, uh, I think the first one is a strange blog. The second one is OSS funds and the third one is fuzz it. So Fuzzit has a good like, rating there and uh, can make it also GitLab appear there. At least this is the, the uh, it's the results on, on my end. I hope. Yeah, I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting the same results. Um, okay. And that one struck me because obviously GitLab is known as uh, for CICD. Uh, so yeah. continuous fuzzing seems like a, a, a natural uh, alignment. Um, yeah. I like that term too. All right. Um, the next item I had was just the JSON uh, uh, fuzzing report. So there's an MR that's opened up on the schema uh, and there's uh, been some discussion, I think on this issue and I think there may be, or this MR and I think there's another MR uh, or issue that's associated with this type of topic, which is what is the results going to look like coming out of um, the coverage guided uh, tool right now, and then uh, what are the results going to look like coming out of uh, the API fuzzing tool? So uh, my plan was to try to set up some time uh, later this week so that we can talk about this and brainstorm as to what our first MVC version of this JSON schema should look like, and uh, also see if we can align the direction that we want to go, whether we want to tend to have um, make that look very similar to our other vulnerability schema, whether it should look completely different, uh, whether the API and the coverage guided uh, are going to look the same and use the same schema. Uh, I think there's a number of questions that we need to answer. So um, I'll set up some time later this week. And then in the meantime, uh, let's continue to comment on this merger question, any of those issues. And then uh, you I think you've got uh, number six. Uh, uh, yeah, just, just, uh, just an update. So, uh... I'm working on the, uh, I'm also working on the merge requests uh, of adding support for like uh, for this new uh, type of report in GitLab CI uh, YAML, which is the coverage fuzzing report, uh, as well as the par parsers, the coverage fuzzing parsers, which uh, essentially is uh, inheriting from a common security parser in the, in the Rails backend. So this is a, uh, this is a web report. Uh, we can feel free to, to comment on it, but uh, it's still not ready. I'm still uh, playing with it and uh, trying to make it work with with the uh, yeah, GitLab Cup fuzz. So uh, GitLab Cup fuzz will output the correct uh, report, and then uh, I'll check that uh, the the backend parses uh, this report correctly. So perfect. And I think in one of these issues, I added a link to I think it was our uh, secret detection. I just added a um, a new report type. Um, I don't know if you saw that merge request from secret detection. Uh, it should yeah, be very similar in terms of the code that needs to get rid yeah. of this. 
Yeah, I, th I think uh, I saw it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, excellent. Um, so I will finish typing this after I vocalize it. Uh, I put it on Slack yesterday, but wanted to share with the broader group. Um, we have the customer advisory board coming up on the 1st of July. And so this is really our chance to interface directly with a handful of customers. There's usually about a dozen or so of our, our larger ultimate and premium customers there. Um, what I would like us to do for that is actually to put a small demo of what we can for fuzz testing together to be able to show that. Um, so it would be something that wouldn't have to necessarily be polished and it would be run by someone from GitLab, most likely David. So we wouldn't have to you know, be worried about users doing anything wonky with it. Uh, but yeah, I, I just wanted to talk about that. I think if Seth, the link you put there for the demo project, that looks like a great place to, to use that and show it to people. And then Yevgeny, I was thinking the demo you've shown us a number of times is probably a great piece of content to show so we don't actually have to build anything new for it. Yeah, so, so the demo that I, sure, sure. So the demo that I showed, um, I think it can be run by, uh, essentially by anyone, like by, da by David uh, or anyone. And uh, the, uh, so I don't know if, uh, um, well, maybe, yeah, but maybe by, by July also we'll have like a next version of the demo with the support of the new coverage report. Uh, which I'm working on now, uh, but uh, it will be only available on local versions. So either I'll have to mm. run this or like David will have to set up like the local version and um, check out my branch, which is, will be a bit more complex. But uh, yeah, but essentially it's possible. Yeah. Okay. I suppose what we could also do is record a video of it beforehand too. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly for our uh, thirteen two release, uh, we'll have a, I'd like to get a demo of uh, all the functionality that goes through the documentation and shows the setup. Um, so that'll certainly be there. I don't know whether for July one, we'll have that ready to go. Um, we'll have mm -hmm. to kind of see how things go the next week or two. Yeah, I think yeah, I, I think like the the MR that I'm working, uh, really hope it will be like the, this will be ready like the, this version or this MR should be ready. I think um, if I want to hit any any major roadblocks, but uh, what will take time is is I think uh, or might take time uh, is the review of the MR, uh, though it's not a database MR, which I think should be. Uh, faster, but still, it uh, might take time. Well, if it's, it has to be run locally anyways, could we do a screen recording of it before the MR got merged? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's possible. Okay. Cool. So yeah, I just wanted to bring that up with this group and we'll keep talking about it uh, leading up to the cab here in a few weeks. And is that uh, cab kind of a showcase of things that we're working on or is it, um, you know, a little bit of a showcase and then get feedback from the customers? Uh, a little of both. So generally the way that it's approached is there's an overall company update in terms of general product strategy. Then there's a specific area that gets highlighted each time the group meets this time it's security. Um, and so we'll go through the presentations, go through a demo of what we're working on, and then it's open for feedback, but that feedback can be about anything. So it's either on the demos or on any of the general company stuff as well. I'm happy to share notes uh, and recordings from that after it happens with you all too. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, James, you've got the next one. Uh, yeah, it's related to our work on fuzzing. Um, I am putting together two different brown bags. I didn't finish typing up the second one. Um, on here, copy paste this. Uh, one of them on dog fooding uh, fuzzing with GitLab the product, and so the GitLab runner one should. The goal is to 
set things up so that when the MVC that Evgeny is working on is ready, uh, we should be able to use that directly with GitLab Runner. Um, so doing research and getting that going um, and then fuzzing GitLab CI.yaml. Um, it's a different use case, uh, but working through the specifics of fuzzing things within a major project um, would be good to show people. I may add a third item of dog fooding, um, but I don't know if I'll get to it. And this other one is about oof, uh, unit test derived coverage based fuzzing with Python, Ruby, and Go. That's an extension of the PyTest auto explorer work that I did. Um, but cleaning things up and making it work on Python, Ruby, and Go. Uh, I haven't scheduled them yet. The first one, um, I am thinking I'll schedule it for next week. And this one, either end of next week or the week after that. Um, yeah, anyways, figured I'd let you guys know. Uh, yeah, I will definitely drop a message in the channel of once they're scheduled. Oh, and they are recorded too, so yeah. James, is the first one you're talking about with the runner and the YAML file, is that, are you fuzzing the implementation of the runner and the implementation of the YAML parser? Or did you mean you're using, you're running the runner to fuzz the YAML parser? Oh, no, it's fuzzing sense. GitLab runner itself. And then the YAML okay, is cool. fuzzing the YAML parser itself. Okay, I got it. So it's like two separate fuzzing two separate ones. targets, yeah. not using one to fuzz it. Okay. Uh, okay. Exactly, yeah. So it would be, it's a collection of dog fooding instances. Yeah. <laughs> um, got it. With maybe okay. a third one. Oh, and I'm done. You've got uh, covers uh, everything. Unless uh, there's any last minute additions. Nothing from me. Perfect. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, enjoy the uh, rest of your day. Talk to you later. Thanks, folks.